the Urasovs were one of the strongest, most respected chess families in Russia back in the 1800s. Sergei Urasov was particularly well known. He was one of Leo Tolstoy's good friends, and he ultimately left his chess library to Tolstoy's son, Ilya. He was also one of the absolute best players of his day, and he left us the Urasov Gambit. Today's game comes from Nikolai Urasov, who played a number of sharp correspondence chess games, including this masterpiece with a brilliant finish that I have as my 10th best chess game of the before 1900s. The opening moves are pawn to e4, pawn to e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, and pawn to b4, the beginning of the Evans Gambit. Now, once upon a time, this was basically one of the most standard ways to begin a chess game, and I would love to see it become standard once again. It leads to very exciting chess. I have hundreds of games in the Evans Gambit myself. Now here, after pawn to b4, we see bishop takes b4. The acceptance of the sacrifice is brave, not cowardly. You cannot reject the sacrifice in the 1800s and be thought a strong chess player. Here we see pawn to c3 and bishop c5. Not a bad move, but it does kind of walk into pawn to d4, which white doesn't play right away. White castles first and then plays pawn to d4. After a trade on d4, we see bishop to b6. And this is a decent way for black to play. Probably not the best way for black to play, but a decent way for black to play. There is pressure on d4 here, which can be augmented with bishop to g4. So black in this position deal or white in this position deals with the pressure on d4 by immediately removing moving the pawn on d4, advancing it to d5, and attacking the knight. The knight goes over to a5, attacking the bishop on c4, although there's not really a threat to capture that bishop because there is queen to a4 check, which picks the piece back up. At least, knight takes c4 wouldn't win material, although white probably wants to hold on to the bishop and leave the knight on a5. Bishop b2, though, doesn't provide an opportunity to capture here because bishop takes g7 would just trap the rook in the corner. So knight to e7 so that if the pawn is captured, black can move the rook and then capture over here, giving back a pawn but freeing the pieces. White says, no, I don't want your pawn back. Uh, instead, I'm going to play bishop back to d3, holding on to my light squared bishop and trying to say that this knight is misplaced over here on a5. So in this position, we get castles for black, knight to c3, knight g6, and in general, white has maybe about enough compensation for the pawn right here with the extra space, active pieces, really nice bishop right over here, etc. However, white is going to drift in this position, not ever really creating uh, a development that has a purpose, a plan, real threats. And as a result, black is going to kind of uh, uncoil and pretty soon basically just have an extra pawn. Here we see knight to e2, which could allow bishop to g4, which black doesn't play and I'm not really sure why because it's very tempting and the engine does like it. Pawn to c5 uh, in this position, which gives a little more freedom and protection over here. There is some concern that if you don't play pawn to c5, which is a little weird because it blocks in this bishop, that the knight on a5 could start to feel trapped at some point by moves like this. Uh, so queen to d2, pawn to f6, saying, hey, you know, let's not uh, have pawn to e5 as a pawn break at some point. And also maybe I'll put a knight on e5 with this extra support here. And hey, your bishop on uh, b2 is looking pretty good and f6 kind of blunts that. So a multi-purpose move. King h1. A purposeless move. I, I don't know why this is played and it doesn't really help the white position. Bishop to c7, rook to c1. Also don't really understand this move. Uh, the pawn on c5 is really secure. So what is the rook doing on c1? Rook over to b8 now, getting ready to move these pawns up the board. And the extra pawn for black has kind of been a theoretical advantage so far. Maybe someday that extra pawn will matter in an endgame, but it will actually start to be an immediately valuable asset if we get b5, c4, and those pawns start moving on the queen side, that extra pawn will be felt very quickly in that case. Knight to g3, thinking about going into f5, although black is maybe considering capturing that at some point if it does hop in there. Pawn to b5, knight f5, and not in this case bishop takes f5, which is a good decision from black. I would love to eliminate this knight because it is a very nice knight on f5 and it has a great future in the game. But if bishop takes f5 after pawn takes f5, 
the knight needs to move, and it really wants to go in here, of course. This square is calling out to it. But after knight e5, bishop takes e5 is a problem because you just don't have a good recapture. Uh, if you capture back here, then rook takes e5, picks up a pawn right away. And if you capture this way, then white has the idea of bringing the knight around into e6. And that will be a lovely, lovely knight. So after knight f5, black just pushes forward, pawn to c4, tickling the bishop. It pulls back to e2 and pawn to b4. And this move is a mistake. Now, there may be a few things going on here, but I think the main thing is that black has miscalculated. Black has identified a tactic that defends the pawn on c4. And black has said, well, if you can't capture on c4 because of my tactic that will win an exchange, then why not push? My pawns are really strong here and I start to have ideas like pawn to c3. And that is true, but white falls into the tactic, calculating a little bit deeper. Here we get bishop takes c4, and after knight takes c4, rook takes c4, bishop a6 is the tactic. The rook on c4 and the rook on f1 are skewered, and so black is winning an exchange. The problem is that after rook takes c7, which threatens this, so there's no time to capture this rook if you were trying to decide which rook do I capture, you have to capture the rook on c7. Queen takes c7, rook c1. It basically comes out here that white has kind of sacrificed an exchange in this, and black has not won an exchange. And white has excellent compensation for the exchange. The knight on f5 is already fantastic. The bishop on b2 is beautiful. And this knight can head to either e6 or c6, and white has the only open file on the board as well. So you can't really ask for much more for an exchange right here. And the engine already thinks that white has full compensation. And on a human level, I think basically everyone would prefer to be white in this position. So queen to d8, the queen pulls back. Knight to d4 saying, hmm. Mm, I want one of these squares. And hey, these are forks. I could win an exchange, but I don't even know if I want to win an exchange back because I really like being a knight on e6 or c6. Uh, rook to c8, knight to e6 with the fork. Rook takes c1 uh, here and bishop takes c1. You don't want to capture with the queen because a queen trade is in black's interest and black would immediately offer that. Uh, queen to b6. And now this pawn falls here. Of course, we can again regain the exchange, but knight takes f8, king takes f8, actually gives up much of the advantage, and this position is much closer to equal. Instead, the stronger move is not to give up, uh, not to win the exchange, but instead to play knight takes g7. Picking up a pawn and wrecking the defenses around black's king. We still have two fantastic knights here, and this bishop is only going to gain in power with the absence of the g7 pawn. So queen to b5, little bitty threat of checkmate down here. Of course, white sees it. Pawn to h3, queen to f1 check, king to h2. And this is a sharp position. Urusov had to calculate very deeply here because if he had not, then he would be losing after knight to h4. The threat here is, of course, queen takes g2 checkmate, which is incredibly nasty. There's only one good move here. It might seem like you can play pawn to f3 in this position because you're defending g2 with the queen, but then after bishop to e2, black actually has a winning attack. Uh, I think there are maybe quite a few threats in this position. Uh, but the biggest one is queen takes g2 checkmate, and what are you going to do? Uh, you're not going to survive for long in this position. Knight f4 is one idea, for example, defending uh, the g2 pawn this way, but then king takes g7 because you needed your knight to be defending the other knight on g7. So after knight h4 and this big conundrum, how to deal with the attack and threat of checkmate here on g2, White reveals the deep calculation, king to g3, a really brilliant move. Now, 
first off, you of course have to realize that after queen takes g2 check, there's king takes h4, and there's no follow-up for black. This is not checkmate. <laughs> that square is controlled by a knight and also the queen and the bishop, and there's actually no follow-up here for black, really. I mean, you can give a check with queen takes e4, but queen to f4, and the white king is safe, and white has a big advantage, maybe a winning advantage. So after king to g3 attacking the knight, we see knight takes g2. And again, black could be better here. I mean, we're threatening, for example, knight to e1, and then again, the ideas of queen to g2, but white has a decisive combination here, and white finds the only winning path. Knight to f5, excellent move. It's not immediately clear what this does, but after knight to e1, with the idea of queen to g2, black would be winning had knight f5 not prepared a combination. And this is the moment to pause your video and try to figure out what it is. Well, the decisive continuation is queen to g5 check. A really beautiful, unique, and brilliant queen sacrifice that white has prepared over the last several moves. And this path was the only one to a win in these complex lines that began with king g3. Now, the reason, of course, that this is brilliant is that we are sacrificing the, uh, the queen here to the pawn. And of course, there's no chance to not accept the sacrifice because if the king tries to run, then we just invade with queen g7 and mate either immediately or just in a moment. So after queen to g5 check, we see pawn takes g5. And I've never seen a mating combination like this. It is really sweet. We have knight to h6 check, and the two knights cover almost all of the squares here, except one. The king steps over to h8, and now bishop to b2 check. And I foreshadowed a great future for this bishop and for the knight on f5, and they come together here to deliver checkmate. The knight on e6 has been helpful, but in this case, it is actually really just a bystander because these are the only pieces needed for this final checkmate. Black can play only one move, rook to f6, and the game did conclude with bishop takes f6 and checkmate. I hope you've enjoyed this really brilliant battle. There are some kind of iffy moves in the middle, but the finish here is just spectacular, and the coordination of white's pieces is so, so gorgeous. If you want to see more of my favorite chess games from the before 1900 period in chess, click on that playlist that is popping up on your screen.